Good morning. All right, that was decent, decent. Uh, so my wife is pregnant, and we're expecting our third. Uh, you can clap, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and so we're having another boy. Uh, I'm excited. So Haven, our daughter, Nolan, our son, and then another one, December 18th. We'll see uh, what date he shows up. Uh, but we're getting to a point where our daughter and our son can pretty much, for the most part, entertain themselves, right? Sometimes you hear some screaming from the playroom when you're sitting downstairs, but you know, it's okay, it, it calms down. But we thought it would be fun to press the reset button uh, and do it all again, start from scratch, right? Uh, and I wanna be a little vulnerable with you this morning. Uh, newborn stage, while cute and cuddly, uh, is not, not my favorite season of life, if I can be honest. Uh, babies cry a lot, right? They eat, they sleep sometimes, they poop and pee, and then they repeat, right? It's this process, this cycle. Uh, and babies cry for different reasons, but at the, at the bottom line, why they cry is because they're mad. They're angry. They are hungry. So what do they do? They whine and scream until you feed them, right? They poop their pants and they're all messy. And so what do they do? They're mad until you clean and change their diaper. Man, they cry because they didn't sleep because they are too tired, because that makes sense, right? Man, I can't wait till December. Uh, my, point, my point is this, though. From early on, we all experience this emotion of anger. It's an emotion that we have all felt, and for some of us, it's a significant problem. For some of us, maybe not so much. Uh, for some, it can happen in a matter of a second. For others, it takes a little bit of time to get you upset and angry. But wherever you are on the spectrum, I think we can uh, at some point uh, agree to that we have been angry. And maybe for you, it was at carpool this week where the person should not have gone in front of you. <laughs> maybe for you, it was in a meeting with your boss where you left and you were gonna quit and you were so mad. Maybe for you, you're mad at your spouse who happens to be sitting right beside you, or maybe a friend or a teacher, your kids. Maybe you're angry with where you are at in life right now. For some of you, it's traffic. Maybe some of you, the Panthers came last week, right? Anger is something that we all can resonate with. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, anger is something that you deal with and even find destructive in your own life as we do. And so the question becomes, is it ever okay to be angry? And if so, what does that even look like? Anger, for the most part, can be always associated with negativity. But this morning, what if anger actually reveals to us a characteristic of God? What if anger is actually an opportunity to act more godly and point people to Jesus. And, and if that's the case, then every day we will be more than likely able to take advantage of that opportunity. And if we don't learn to handle anger in a proper way, here's what is at stake. Anger can then lead to hatred. And then it can lead to actually the opposite of what God intended. However, if we approach anger as followers of Jesus, then we can experience it in which the way God designed it. See, anger is part of who he is. We get angry because in part, we are image bearers of a God who sometimes gets angry. So that means for us, there's hope that we can deal with this negative emotion in a healthy and mature way. See, practicing the way of Jesus, it doesn't do away with things like anger. But what it does is it actually can be this beautiful picture of redemption and grace. However, if we don't handle this carefully, it can be extremely destructive and sinful. So today, as we open up God's word, we look through some Psalms uh, and at this emotion of anger, I wanna first begin by defining a couple of terms for you. 
Now, I got these definitions from a book called The Cry of the Soul, and I found them to be super helpful uh, when it comes to thinking about emotions. And so Dr. Dan Allender, he says this, he says, anger is a response to an assault based on a degree of perceived injustices. Now, let me pause there, because when I say the word injustice, a lot of things can come to mind. It can spark emotion, different meanings, preconceived notions. And, and before moving forward, whenever I use the term injustice, here's what I'm referring to. It's a vi- any violation of God's design for life. Now, when I say injustice, this is what I mean. Any violation of God's design for life. See, injustice, it comes in various degrees. Not all injustices are equal, but injustice against us and others is what leads us to anger. We all experience injustice through our lives that invoke anger. And when anger happens, there's some natural tendencies that we go to. For some of us, we run away. (laughs) We run away. When we are hit with the emotion of anger, we run away. For some of us, we ignore it. Then we keep ignoring it. Then we keep ignoring it. And then it explodes, right? For some of us, we actually stop and think through how to handle this. And we try to deal with it in a way that would be honoring to God. But if we're going to be honest, most of us, many of us, we pick up arms and we fight. We pick up arms and we fight and someone is preventing me from what I desire or they've created this injustice against me. And as a result, I'm gonna take control and I'm gonna get what I want. I want justice right now and I'm gonna compromise anything and everything to do whatever it takes. And what we do unintentionally, sometimes intentionally, is we actually bypass God in the whole situation. Uh, He isn't giving me justice, so I'll go get justice for myself. Or this, this isn't like a big enough injustice, and so I'll just handle this one on my own. And so we're found in this tension of waiting on God to bring justice. And if we're being honest this morning, none of us like to wait, right? Nobody likes to wait. The cry of the soul states this, anger allows you to escape, at least momentarily, the panic of waiting and the pain of hoping. See, injustice forces us to ask this question, is God just? Maybe you've asked that question before. Maybe you've personally experienced injustice. Maybe you saw something on TV, the Ukraine war, college debt debate, racism. Maybe something has happened to your family member or a close friend and it burns deep within you and you react and you angrily ask God, if you are just, then why? Like if you fight for justice, then why is there so much in justice? And this morning, I wanna encourage you. It's okay to ask that question. It's okay to wrestle with that question. It's okay to voice your concern to God. And what we see in the Psalms is numerous times where people do that. And I'm grateful for God's word because when I read it, sometimes I'm like, man, I'm not the only one. I'm glad I'm not the only one that has those thoughts. And in Psalm 88, we see this. It says, but I, O Lord, I cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your tears. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. In the midst of the psalmist, his challenges, his injustices, even encouraged by others to question God, he wrestles with, is God gonna make this right? And this is where it can get tricky because here's what happens. If it doesn't look like what we think it should look like, and if it doesn't happen in the timeframe that we think it should happen, this question that says, is God just, goes down into a different layer and and we begin to ask, if God is just, then will he, he let the wicked win? Will he let the wicked be victorious? See, the opposite of God's righteous anger is unrighteous anger. 
Unrighteous anger, as defined by Dr. Allender, is this, a dark energy that demands for the self a more tolerable world now instead of waiting for God's redemption according to divine design and timing. Now, bear with me for a second. This isn't a perfect analogy, but maybe you can relate. Have you ever hit send on a text or comment on a post and then realized, I just misread that? (laughs) And now you're in a heated argument with someone Maybe online, someone you have no idea who it is, but maybe a spouse and you're like, I misread your text, but now you took the step too far and out of anger, what you did was you reacted. And so now you have to go back and start over and you have to waste a whole lot of time if you would have just stopped, waited, been patient and thought through what you were gonna say. You wouldn't be where you are. But waiting for all of us is frustrating because we live in this instant gratification culture where wait is equal to torture in our minds, right? Waiting makes us uncomfortable. And it's one of the major reasons uh, why is because it shows us how much we are dependent on other people. See, when we take measures into our own hands, or we don't think with the mind of Christ, we're not trusting God to bring justice. And it typically doesn't end well. We would much rather though, in our minds, have a quick fix to the solution and then make life a little bit more tolerable now than waiting on God's timing to bring true and ultimate justice. See, when our anger is not centered on the redemptive work of Jesus, it will always lead to unrighteous anger because unrighteous anger is selfish. Unrighteous anger results in us doing this. We take control, we force people to forfeit their freedom and to succumb to our desires. That's what we do. I didn't get what I want, you created this injustice against me, so I'm gonna take control, I'm gonna make you forfeit your freedom and I am going to make you succumb to what I want. And scripture's clear in James chapter one, The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so if we don't pause and wait and gain perspective, then we can take anger to a place where it wasn't designed to go. Unrighteous anger, it takes control of the situation, takes control of the person in attempt to grab hold of what we believe is best for us. We try to satisfy this hunger to fulfill our desires. And when we don't get what we want, we take it out on other people. We take it out on other people. And in Psalm 59, we see David crying out to God as Saul sends men to try and to kill him. And what we see is he's expressing that these men's desire is that David be killed, trying to fulfill Saul's selfish desires and getting the justice that he thinks he deserves. But they're not filled And they don't get what they desire. And so what do they do? They get angry. Psalms 59 says this. It says, each evening they come back, howling like dogs, prowling about the city. They wonder about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. And we see this also played out when the Israelites are on the brink of being overrun by the Assyrians. They're wrestling with this question, is God just? Can we trust him to bring justice? And can we trust him in his timing? And when things don't go as they desire or want or think it should, they feel like they've been mistreated. So what do they do? They take things into their own hands. In Isaiah chapter eight, it says this, and they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and they will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and they will turn their faces upward. Hanger is real, right? It's in the Bible right there, right? Hanger is real. Anyway, at the end of the day, the heart of an unrighteous anger is centered on a desire to control and the idea that I can't be vulnerable. I can't be vulnerable. And once again, it all stems back to how you answer the question, is God just? 
And if we're left to our own devices, the answer to that question will fluctuate. Some days it would be like, yes, he is. Some days it would be like, no, he's not. Based on circumstances in our life, seasons in our life, that answer will be hard to answer. And so that's why we have to trust and look to God's word for help. And this is why I love the Psalms and why we're looking at the Psalms throughout the series is because it continuously tells us of who God is in light of our emotion. Psalms 89, 14 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Psalm 111, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. Psalm 99, the king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Scripture testifies to how just God is. He loves justice and he fights for it. And this is good news for you and for me in the midst of us asking this question, is God just? We can be reminded time and time again that God is just. And if we would just pause for one second and reflect on who God is, that he is in control, that he loves and fights for justice, then we can have a perspective on anger that aligns with God. And this is where we get the idea of righteous anger. This is where we get the idea of righteous anger. According to Dr. Allender, it says this, righteous anger allows the offense to be seen as an issue between the offender and God. Righteous anger allows us to get out of our head and see a bigger, better perspective. When we are first hit with this emotion of anger, what we do with it then has the ability to either align with God or not. We can align with God's perspective or we can align with our perspective. Righteous anger puts us in the mind of God and actually allows us to wrestle with the question, the pain of what righteous anger actually cost. See, righteous anger is giving up control, is trusting God, and is surrendering to his desires. Giving up control, trusting God, surrendering to his desires. It forces us to realize that we are not sufficient. We could never on our own bring the justice that's required. Righteous anger forces us to learn from God's perspective and helps us. And we see this in Psalm 145 that the Lord is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. Yet he executes his justice with wrath and with fury. And this is what makes it paradoxical. And it's a lot of times hard for us to grasp. Like if God is love, if God is love, then how could he execute his wrath? Now, as I was just studying for this message, Tyler, who reads all these brainiacs, gave me an awesome quote uh, to help wrestle with this. But there's a Croatian theologian why he was reading Croatian theologians, I have no idea, but it's super helpful. Uh, Maroslav Vov, and he wrote in this book, Free of Charge, this. I used to think that the wrath uh, was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love, and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region in which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed. Over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities destroyed and people shelled day in and day out, some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. 
Or think of Rwanda the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in grandparently fashion, refusing to give, condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness, wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think I would have to rebel against God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. See, love is what motivated God to execute his righteous anger, his wrath onto a son. But what caused God to get there? To get to his righteous anger? Injustice. Violation of his design. Violation of his design gets him to where we see he had to execute anger onto his son. We go back to Genesis and we see that God created everything perfectly. And he deemed it, it was very, very good. But something happened. Humanity tried to play God and take control and being in their own hands. And so sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And as a result, you and I naturally do the same thing. We try to play God. We take control into our own desire, our own hands. We choose our desires over his desires. And some once said that the fundamental sin of the garden was a desire to determine good and evil for ourselves. But history and our own experience demonstrates that we are generally terrible at this. And by doing so, we deserve a punishment. We commit injustice against a holy God, a righteous God, a just God. And God in his perfect timing, decided to take out his anger, his hatred of sin, his hatred of injustice out in a way that would seem ironic. In our mind, we take anger out on the person who committed the injustice against us. They deserve to be punished. We get what we want, they don't. And that's what we think God would do with his creation, who choose to continue to commit injustice against him but he doesn't. He doesn't. God decides to take his anger, to execute his wrath and punishment, not on the offender, but on himself, his one and only son who did nothing wrong, committed zero injustices, lived a perfect life, surrendered to the father. What? Why on earth? Makes zero sense. But biblical authors repeatedly make it clear that wrath was focused on the cross. Love was the motivating factor. Love. In the midst of his righteous anger, there was redemption. There was hope. There was love. Then that shows us that helps us understand that in our anger, we actually can display the redemptive work of Jesus. In our anger, we can demonstrate and marvel the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We have committed the the biggest of injustices. We are guilty of that, trying to take control into our own hands. And yet the one deserving of issuing justice chose to put it on his son. So for us, anger exists to direct us to hate sin, to destroy it, to fight for righteousness with love being the foundation. See, with this perspective, we see ourselves in the sin that we have the wrath that we deserve, and what does it do? It directs us to Jesus. We see that God executed his wrath on his son with us in mind, with redemption in mind. And so for us to practice the way of Jesus, we have to look to him and to his lead. And now you might be sitting there like, okay, I get it. I get what you're saying. So what do we do? Like get practical for one second for me and help me not get angry so my wife won't hate me. 
or not get angry so my kids don't grow up to resent me, or I don't get fired, or I don't get detention. Like, what can I do to fix this? And this morning, I have two words for you. It's wait and reflect. Wait and reflect. And this answer might make some of you angry right now in this room, but just wait and reflect with me. See what I did there? Uh, For a second. See, to wait means to trust God in his timing. Waiting allows you to actually slow down, respond to the situation instead of react. See, a lot of times anger causes us to react. We're not thinking, we're not waiting. We just act in the midst of a hurt or a pain. Unrighteous anger refuses to surrender. It refuses to wait on God. It refuses to look to him and gain perspective for help. So here's what waiting does. Waiting allows you to get in the right mindset. Waiting allows you to get in the right mindset. So if you want to experience this righteous anger, we have to pause and wait. Trust that God is just and he will respond accordingly. Sometimes though waiting, it intensifies our desire and and exposes our loss of control, compelling us to either trust him or not. And so I would encourage you to trust him because when you do, it causes desperation. And what Paul mentioned last week, desperation then leads to dependence and the dependence leads to surrender. We surrender to his will, his way, his perspective, And we see God demonstrating waiting as well. Isaiah 48, nine, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I will restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. Second Peter 3, nine, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wanting any, not wishing that anyone should perish, that all should be reach repentance. See, sometimes anger will call us to step up and to vocalize it and to fight against injustice in a way that's motivated by love and to direct people to God. But sometimes it causes us to remain silent and to trust God. And when that happens, we reflect. We reflect. We gain perspective. We look to the cross we see that righteous anger always leads to this opportunity of redemption. It warns people injustice is wrong, it's sin. It offers a different way, a difficult way, death to yourself, but in the end, ultimate justice is what you get. See, the return of Jesus, the return of Jesus will usher in justice for all. He'll make all raw things right. And it will give us the ability to know that all injustice one day will cease to exist. Man, what a beautiful day that will be. What a beautiful day that will be. What do we get to hope for? And here's the cool thing. When we begin to reflect on that, it will make us want to fight for that here and now. It will make us want to fight for that here and now because here's what happens. Reflecting allows you to have the right motive. While waiting gives you the right mindset, reflecting gives you the right motive. And the question becomes this morning, are you willing to wait? Are you willing to reflect? Are you willing to answer yes to the question, is God just? And if so, just maybe, in the midst of our anger, we can put on display the beautiful redemptive work of Jesus. We can invite people into this paradox that we have a loving God who wants to destroy injustice. See, Anger doesn't have to be ugly and vindictive. Anger can be beautiful and redemptive. So as we wrap up today, I want us to actually try this. Now, some of you in this room, you might not be angry right now. It's okay, right? Maybe I could say a couple things, get you riled up a little bit. But 
after I pray, Psalm 37 is gonna scroll on the screens. Uh, And reading scripture actually is a beautiful way to put this into practice, to wait and to reflect, because it slows you down. Sometimes when we read scripture, it's like, check, done. Instead of just pausing and waiting and asking God to speak through his word, because I think his word is beautiful and it penetrates our hearts and speaks to our minds. And so sometimes it actually helps us put into words emotions that we are feeling. And so I wanna use this, this psalm as a guide to give you words. Maybe, maybe even start a conversation between you and God talking about anger. Now this video is about two and a half, three minutes. It's gonna feel long. Trust me, I've watched it a couple times this week. But here's what it did. It helped me orient my mind. And it helped me understand that sometimes time, even a small amount, can feel long. But when we see the benefit of waiting, when we see the benefit of reflecting, it makes it worth it. It makes it worth it. So this morning... Would you wait and reflect with me? Let's pray. Jesus, just in all of who you are. God, forgive me for when I get angry and don't put display on the redemptive work that you've did for us. So God, this morning in this moment, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak. Your word is living and active, is sharper than any double-edged sword and it will penetrate to the heart. And so this morning in this room, I don't know where everybody is at with you or where they're at in life, but my prayer is that through your word, that you would surround them, comfort them, challenge them, encourage them. So God, as we work on this emotion of anger. Allow us to wait and reflect on the redemptive work of Jesus and allow that to be the motivating factor in how we conduct ourselves. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.